so far, there's been 10 tapes found. With each tape, a story could be put together. What are the Greylock tapes? This is an analog horror series that I surprisingly haven't heard about until now. Though it makes sense to tell how relatively new these tapes are since the first record of them being discovered was on March 13th of the same year. So let me ask you a question. Have you ever wanted to explore the darkest parts of your mind? What would happen if we did? Think about that as we wander inside the disturbed, unknown territory that the Greylock tapes hold within them. I do have to give a warning that there will be potentially graphic topics and imagery shown, along with flashing lights. Without wasting any more time, this is a short, untold story of the most disturbing analog horror series I have ever watched. The first tape within the series is called Back Online, and seems to be a series of camera systems that we cycle through within an unknown building. The video itself shows what appears to be an office looking area, a place where there are these computers that are very reminiscent from those from the late 1990s and various other locations that have seemed to have gone through heavy decay, giving the indication that the specific tape was either made during that time period or this location was simply used quite a long time ago but was ultimately abandoned. With how messed up and dirty these places present to look like, the latter is most likely true. Now, the more important aspect to this tape is the audio recording behind it. It is robotic, and we could quickly understand that it appears to be some sort of security system the way it describes what's happening around it. Whoever this person is, they enter this place but not with the permission of the previous owners, as we noticed that they had to hack through the security systems in order to start extracting data from an archival storage. Before the video ends, we get one quick logo. Simioden.usa, probably the name of the company that owns this facility. For now, that is all this tape can provide us. It's one of the shorts within the whole series and will be very important for later on. We'll need to keep this mysterious company in the back of our minds as we continue forward with the rest of these tapes. The second tape is simply called To The Mountain, and that's exactly what's happening. It appears that whoever is driving is doing so late at night while listening to a radio with the preacher giving a sermon. To walk in the path of obedience so that we may never be guilty of tempting the devil to tempt us. We are not to enter the thicket in search of the lion. We may pay dear- the first few minutes of this tape is basically only that, but there is one part that I want to focus on, which was the final line that was given to us by the radio. We are not to enter the thicken in search of the lion. We may pay dearly. An interesting point for the creator to choose to stop at, as we then follow whoever is recording out of their car and walk up this dark mountain trail. As they progress, we seemingly see what appears to be blood and snow, but even after seeing this, they push further. At many points, having this distorted glitching which pushes us either further in time or rewinds the tapes. Something I'll touch on soon. Which is when we hear... This could be a radio, but also some sort of TV news station which could be giving up some insight as to why this person is here in the forest. face to face with the devil himself. 
We learn quite a bit of information if we really listen to distorted audio, which at times can be difficult to tell what they're trying to say. Something in this mountains is hunting. Of course, it could be a wild animal like a wolf or a bear, which would have explained the mutilated animal carcasses that were found. A simple thing that always happens out in the wild. However, when looking even closer, the remains of a human are found as well, and for some reason, really focusing on the point of a human skull. With this skull most likely being either inside of the animal carcass or very close to it. What's even weirder is that a total of 18 men all want to stay anonymous as well. Was there something out there that possibly scared them so badly that they don't even want to be associated with it at all? With the very last thing that we see at the end of the mountain trail being this tree. I'm not exactly sure what this thing hanging behind it is yet, but I do have a few theories. With the most plausible theory that I have that it could potentially be some sort of white floppy disk, with a major part of this theory being influenced by the previous video and its older fashioned computers. This could also be why we are in a forest in the first place. I do want to touch on the glitches that occur within this tape which seem… odd. Usually with an analog horror, glitches such as the one presented are usually used to progress the tapes or change locations quickly, but here, it seems out of order. Moving back in time, going too far in the future, and then back to the present. What's even stranger is when this happens near a tree, as it might be in the perspective of two individuals. One that's leaving the floppy disk for someone else, and the other who is there to pick it up. Though this is all speculation for now. After this individual assumingly picks up whatever was behind that tree, they make it back into their car, and it appears that the same preacher from before returns on the radio, but there's something different. He appears to almost want you to accept the devil into your heart. The devil is gonna call to those depths, dear believer. And though you may tremble before the beast, you should make it easier on yourself and accept what it is that he bestows upon you. <laughs> Which is when we hear some banging and whoever is driving starts to go down the road extremely fast. Having the preacher's distorted words almost taunting them as they drive away. Before, this preacher was talking about fighting away the devil, but has completely switched his message only after we went into this mountain. What was the cause of this? The weird tree we came in contact with or the white object that we seemingly picked up? Just remember this one scene for later on. Orientation Protocols follows a much more traditional formatting that many earlier analog horror would implement within their own series. Here, we learn about something that's called Project Stargate, created by the United States government in collaboration with, once again, Simiodin.USA, the mysterious company from the very first tape. Instead of being this broad orientation letting those involved understand everything, this video is specifically targeted towards those within Unit 13. Which is when we finally get the first important piece of information on what's actually going on within this universe. This branch of government is trying to study a unique form of parapsychology, which is a real thing that some try to understand through the study of this specific area of psychology. However, many are skeptical of it, mostly due to involving many forms of the paranormal and the supernatural. Simply put, things like hypnosis, telepathy, and many other things that aren't associated with orthodox scientific psychology, which is why this field of study is typically criticized to just be a pseudoscience. What the government is focusing on here are these things called thought forms, or a tulpa, another concept from the real world. These two words are interchangeable and mean the same thing. To quote the tape, they are a manifestation of a person's will, emotion, or other deeply psychological energized state into a semi-physical form. With it being important to note that although this new entity could be seen as an extension of oneself, they are better described to be their own independent creature since anyone, even those who didn't actually manifest them, can view them. Although this creation usually happens accidentally, there are cases where one or a group of people can intentionally try to create one of these beings as well. Traditional thought forms can vary widely in their level of influence in the real world. 
While they usually take physical formations eventually, their earliest stages are more apparitional in nature, with brief manifestations, though most often remaining as an unseen essence, much like a phantom or a ghost. At this phase, thought forms and ghosts are very similar in a number of ways. Individuals can make contact with them through communication devices, such as a Ouija board or through EVP sessions, while the thought form may respond through moving objects, manipulating electronics, or even speaking words in short phrases. Due to their striking similarities, a current theory established by Unit 13 suggests that what we know as ghosts may not be as common as we once believed. Rather than a deceased person's energy being left behind after death, it's possible, and indeed likely, that these paranormal entities are actually thought forms that are unintentionally created by those individuals that the deceased has left behind, who spend inordinate amounts of time in deeply emotional states, where their mental capacity is largely occupied by a powerful focus on the departed individual. In other words, as these are the ideal conditions from which thought forms are born, people may very well create their own ghosts and hauntings. However, as more time and energy is invested into the development of the thought form, they begin to harness more influence on their environment, until eventually exhibiting a semi-permanent physical appearance, and, in due course, becoming as tangible as a living creature. This is where Unit 13's interest comes in. We've sought to answer a very important question. Can thought forms be created in a manner that would benefit American society and help keep American citizens safe? So ghosts are real, but instead just beings left by the intense emotions of those who are close to death. Of course, with the discovery of this, the United States government tries to find some way of trying to manipulate these things in order to benefit themselves. In what way is still unknown, but the possibilities are endless. Which is why we make it to the highest known authority figure of the Stargate project, who is a man named Dr. Bernard Hayes. Someone who oversees most of the experiments himself, and the person responsible for a very important invention. Introducing The Thought Form Manifester the thought form manifester is able to create truly independent and self-sustaining thought form entities from the minds of select, willing participants. Being that they come from the deepest recesses of the human mind, thought forms can appear in virtually any configuration. They could look like a person, an object, an animal, or even something as abstract as the physical representation of an emotion. That being said, it's recommended to brace yourself before touring the thought form chambers, as thought forms can also take on appearances that could be considered disturbing, like a creature one might see in a childhood nightmare. There's no reason to be afraid, however. All thought forms are docile by nature, and while they may look or behave in a frightening manner, and though they are capable of making physical contact, they pose no threat to humans. Once your session in the thought form manifester is completed, your thought form will be securely transported directly into a containment chamber. Thought forms are unable to pass through the barrier of the and will not be capable of causing you any issues. There are some very rare potential side effects that may result from your session. These side effects include increased tiredness, loss of balance, dizziness, insomnia, vomiting, episodes of temporary amnesia, and mild hallucinations. These side effects, if present, will clear up within 72 hours of your session, and are simply signs of your brain recalibrating to the real world. This revelation is terrifying. At first, I theorized these thought forms would have just taken the form of humans, since that is what we are probably most comfortable recreating in our own minds. That is not the case. At all. Being able to recreate anything from animals to theoretically actual monsters that we could only literally dream about, understanding how messed up our minds can be due to the limitless creativity that we hold, People have made a lot of terrifying recreations of fear within horror media. We are told that these things are supposed to be docile, which is probably a lie. If the emotion that they are created with was something such as happiness or any other positive emotion, then that could have been true. But like I said, human minds are messed up, and capable of many horrible things. So hypothetically, if the government or specifically this Dr. Bernard want to create a much more impactful use of these thought forms, something such as a weapon, what emotion would they try to use? Something like anger? Fear? What about pain? 
Who knows? As we watch these tapes, we'll find out more, but for now, all we could do is make theories on why exactly these things might turn hostile. This is a tape that needs you to rewatch it multiple times in order to really find out everything within it and is honestly one of the most nerve wracking experiences I've had around 2am. In the beginning, you're supposed to be focusing on the movement within the door as we see someone seemingly pacing around it but if you take a closer look, you'll notice that there was someone else in a window looking in the entire time. Not moving, just standing there. Which is when we make it to someone in the dark holding a flashlight outside of a residential home. As you look inside, various different windows. This might be in the perspective of one of the unexpected visitors that this tape is named after. It's so creepy seeing things from a view of the person or this thing trying to find a way to break into the home, especially with the lack of any kind of sounds. There's no music, just their movement which is when they finally found somewhere to safely get inside. Removing a window pane, and when they finally do make it inside, sound of what I believe to be only one woman screaming. It doesn't last long before they are once again back outside, but within the woods, staring at the moon for a little bit. I'd like to thank my producer, producer my writers, 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 my director, director, my friends, and you. The ordinary PP people who made me what I am today. Next Headroom premieres after moonlighting tomorrow. They did love me. We interrupt our current program at the request of the Massachusetts State Police. This is the emergency broadcast system. This is not a test. All normal broadcasting has been discontinued during the emergency. This station will broadcast official information, news, and instruction for Northern Berkshire County, Massachusetts, after the following tone.
This is a strange occurrence, not the broadcast itself since the government most likely lost one or many thought forms, so this is their way of warning individuals, but it's the information inside that feels… strange. Only one group, not one person, but one group is walking around and attacking people within their homes, with there being a total of 49 residents being victimized. This makes sense since in the beginning of the tape, we do see at least two things outside of this home. However, in the part after, there's only one individual. With the broadcast also warning people to stay inside their homes, lock down everything, and do not involve themselves towards the suspects. Interfering with the investigation could lead to lethal force used against them. With the final part of this tape having someone curious about what's going on. Thanks for the heart attack. Glad that I had my volume maxed out to hear exactly what was going on. What was probably going on within this specific scene is someone was curious about what the emergency broadcast was talking about, and then fixated on the screams going on around them, with those screams most likely belonging to one of their neighbors before they themselves were attacked as well. Slowing down the footage quite a bit reveals some disturbing imagery. With one of the first visible pictures that we see is what appears to be a human face, without any skin, to what I believe is a mask which could potentially be made of someone's flesh. And the reason why I say this is due to the next picture shown being a person's face with parts of it completely torn off. I probably can't show everything here, so if you wish to see this for yourself, please go watch the original. It's very worth it. Now, the most horrifying thing to me about this specific tape was how terrifyingly simple this premise was. Ignoring the fact that these things are probably thought forms, the idea of someone breaking into your home and attacking you in the middle of the night is a very effective way of causing someone to feel uneasy, especially since most of the time, the people watching these kinds of videos are most likely going to be within their own homes. The reason why I'm calling this simple is not in an insulting way, but instead is due to the fact that this kind of thing is very much possible in reality. A home is somewhere where you feel the most safe and secure, a place where you're supposed to sleep soundly, and to me and many others, the place that gives you a break from the outside world. To have a message broadcasted towards masses about home intruders, that safety is now gone. There's a reason why many horror films use home invasions as a premise for their plots. This kind of thing can happen to anyone and even typing this out in the dead of night, completely in the dark. It causes me to constantly look up to stare outside my bedroom window from time to time. This has to be one of the better ways to portray fear as it cultivates it carefully, slowly letting the build up happen while you wait for something to scare you within the dark. Now, jump scares have gotten a bad reputation throughout the years since a lot of people do typically associate them with lazy filming, but I disagree. I do feel as though cheap jump scares are horribly lazy, but when done right, they can be extremely effective, especially in a case like this. Now, for what is happening in the entire this tape, honestly, we don't really know for now. We know that for some reason, there are multiple of these thought forms since the title of this tape is called Unexpected Visitors, as in plural. For what purpose they have going around attacking people isn't really clear, but it could be related to the face mask that was shown near the end. Just a theory for now, but they could possibly try to become fully human in order to fit better in society. But like I said, it's very unclear for now.
This tape is mostly done using dialogue. A woman comes to the hospital to get inspected for a pregnancy and we see the baby with an ultrasound. But of course, this can't stay a happy moment between a soon-to-be mother and her unborn child. There he is. He's definitely a growing boy, that's for sure. And you're both looking really good. Oh, I love hearing that. Let's get some measurements to see exactly exactly how much he's grown. <gasps> what was that? I don't know. I've never seen that before. Maybe something to do with the power. These kinds of tapes love to leave a single frame full of information. Within that error, there's a newspaper clipping talking about, quote, Bizarre events leave Berkshires in terror, authorities mute, with this location being within Massachusetts, the same state the last tape took place in. Although this was the best quality I could make the picture, it still was too blurry to read anything about it, though it most likely was talking about the home invasions from before. What are you talking about? No, 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 no,
like real old. I took a crew in to look through it, but since part of the tunnels caved in some time ago, we're going to just have to bust through it regardless. But I still wanted to make you aware of it. Anyways, I'll keep you moving. Thanks. I wonder if those ancient ruins that they found in that mountain are going to have anything related to something spiritual, supernatural. Hey Frank, it's Paul. Just calling to tell you the day might be a bit slower than usual. Unfortunately, a number of the crew are sick as dogs. Not, uh, not really sure what kind of stomach bugs going around or what, but we'll do our best to pick up slack. I'm calling in some guys who have a day off, so uh, hopefully things will get a little closer to normal, you know? That being said, I don't know how the hell this happened, but the section of the tunnel where I caved in is clear. The tunnel's been wired up with a few lights, too. Wanted to see if maybe you sent someone in while we were off shift. My crew said you didn't, but, you know, I didn't see anybody else either, so... But a few of the guys said they'd seen something running around in the woods surrounding the site. I think it's probably a deer or whatever, but seeing all the ruckus we're making out here, you know? But they all insisted it was something else. Something like a, a real tall man. Might just be some environmentalist moron trying to cause some shit, but, you know, he ain't done nothing, so I told him to keep focused on the project. For safety's sake, we're going to avoid the tunnel until I hear back from you. All right, bye now. A couple of important things. First, somehow there were lights constructed within those tunnels that they themselves don't remember putting up. Thought forms were told to us that they weren't always going to be normal creatures, so perhaps the collective minds of the crew somehow made the light show up, which is why they were sick, since in an earlier tape, it was told to us that around 72 hours after manifesting something, that there were people who reported back feeling sick with various symptoms. With the tall man that they saw being something they manifested as well, but we're not too sure what they could be just yet. Hey Frank, it's Paul again. The guy you sent out to take photos just left, but uh, well, he seemed totally fine when he got here, but we practically had to carry him back to his car when he was done. I don't know if he caught whatever was going around, but figured you should know. Also, we found some really old shit down there, Frank. Now, I ain't no historian, but... We got a guy on the crew who used to do archaeology work or whatever, and I don't know. But I guess there's some old artifacts down there, like weapons and trinkets and whatever. I'll have him draft up a report for you and send it your way, because I feel like he'd be interested, and he can explain all this shit better than I could anyways. His name's Arnold Rivers. That's about it. Alright, bye. Some artifacts are found. Now, whether it's the location that they were in, or the relics that they found, one of these two things could be explaining why there's so many bizarre occurrences happening around within a single location. Frank, something ain't right here. Crew's getting worse, more sick. I, I feel okay so far, but I, I don't know how long that's gonna last. I saw that thing the guys have been talking about last night stalking around in the tree line. I swear it had a face. <sighs> a a anyways, just, just call me back as soon as you can, Frank. Message 5. March 27th, 12.10pm. All our food is rotten, totally spoiled and c covered in maggots. It was perfectly fine and stored. There wasn't any problems with the generator, even if we lost power. <laughs> I mean, it's the end of March. All our food looks like it's been left out in the heat for weeks. No idea what's going on. Please call me back. With the crew getting more sick and possibly more fearful, more people are probably seeing this mysterious tall man. Could it be possible that their negative emotions, for some reason, are being manifested into one single form? It's Paul. We saw it again. Something out here with us. It's in the woods, and it's, it's watching us, goddammit. It ain't no animal either. Who of you guys gonna put up those fancy hunting cameras and see if we can catch anything? Maybe locals fucking with us? I don't know. We'll, we'll figure it out. But yeah, anyways, I, I just... <laughs> Things are getting worse, and the stress of the crew is only going to get higher.
I've tried slowing down the camera and rewatching it a few times, but there doesn't appear to be anything within this part, and it was probably just an error. Green lights moving were found, which shows that this thing is getting more physical. We were told as they start manifesting around, the clearer that they become, which might be why the first camera was triggered. There was something there moving around, but it was still in its early stages that was not fully able to exist yet. was the quote that the series used within the earlier tapes that went along the lines of, don't go into the deep in search of the lion. If you do, we may pay dearly for it. They brought something up from those tunnels. Something bad. Not only did they probably go find something that never should have escaped, Dr. Bernard probably knows what it was, or at least quickly understood that what they found was something dangerous, which is why they used their power to force any emergency services from answering any call that came from the direction. It's much more physical and could be trying to shape itself to be in the form of human at this point. March 30th, time unavailable. Whatever sickness they got from opening up those tunnels most likely transformed their bodies to be these grotesque things. Something that they described was slowly happening to them was how they felt pressure near their eyes and their teeth humming, which is when we get one final detection from the cameras. The same mask we saw in the previous tape. There are a couple of things that could explain what's happening at that location. The one I currently believe in is that Dr. Bernard knew exactly what kind of thing would happen once these tunnels opened up, and this was just one giant experiment to test whatever thing was down there, how it affected the human body. Obviously with the result being that it was very 
gruesome and how it transformed and made the miner sick. With that quote unquote tall man being either something Dr. Bernard sent over in order to trap them within that location or just a manifestation of their own fears. For the lack of outside of communication, it could be due to government interference, but it could also be due to some sort of thing blocking out outside radio waves or the thought forms being able to control electrical devices. To draw back from an earlier tape, we were told that these things were very similar to ghosts, which would make sense that they would have many qualities that are related to spirits as well. This video would have a description, once again, being a decryptic message. There came a red flash, as it pitched from heaven. Corruption wrought truth. 0707. For now, this means nothing, but maybe later on, this could explain something else. Authorities continue to investigate the recent crime wave that swept across northern Berkshire County, left many of its residents in a state of anxiety and panic. It was two weeks ago when the emergency broadcast system was engaged to warn residents to secure their homes due to the activity of a group of individuals who had been targeting and breaking into people's homes. Authorities have since confirmed that the attacks were in fact part of an organized criminal effort and have been attributed to a local anti-American militia group operating out of western Massachusetts called... Police have made numerous arrests in connection to militia and officials continue to release statements to assure the public that they are safe once again. We've seen a lot of credible information over the past couple of weeks, and the investigation is still ongoing. We'll get closer to the by the day. Thankfully, due to the continued efforts of law enforcement, life has been able to return back to normal. Back, back to normal. To no back to normal. To normal. To normal. To normal. To normal. <laughs> normal for residents of Berkshire County. This appears to be a new station reporting on the events that happened a few tapes back when there were frequent home invasions by the thought forms, claiming that things are finally back to normal and people shouldn't be scared anymore. Once again, a news article is shown within a single frame, but this tells us something weird. Much like the previous tape, it expands upon the idea of people getting distorted. Quote, There are horrifying reports of people, healthy, grown adults, becoming deformed, growing extra limbs, teeth growing out of their scalp, people developing severe mental conditions or even sicknesses, doctors have never seen. And that's all we can really see. Before Liar is shown next to the news anchor's face after it becomes distorted. This news article explains why the baby was shown to express how this new phenomenon is affecting everyone, no matter how old or young they are. But it is strange that they're trying to portray this to the public that things are back to normal, even though the opposite is probably true. Yes, these thought forms may have stopped attacking but they left behind something that's causing people to distort their bodies in ways that normally shouldn't be possible. Well that broadcast went completely tits up, didn't it? I've been getting chewed out by our asshole CIA liaison for the past two hours. What the fuck happened? This is a direct continuation from the last tape where these individuals are getting upset about what happened near the end. But by then, the hijacker had already said everything they wanted to say, hadn't they? Yes, sir. What a complete fuck up. They made us look like a fucking joke. I'm sure in our most popular show. Speaking of which, Don, where the fuck is he? I can't get hold of him and he needs to get in here and read a statement to help clean up this fucking mess. Uh, well, we've been trying to reach him. We've called him multiple times. We've tried his pager. We've asked around to see if anyone's heard from him, but nothing. Right now we've got Gerald standing in for him tonight if Don doesn't show. <sighs> You've been to his house? Uh, well, no. I just thought that maybe he'd be upset if I did that. 
get in your fucking car and go to his fucking house. I don't care if you kick down his front door and drag him here by his ear. You bring him into the studio. Do you understand? Yes, Mr. Rosen. Um, of course, I'll do that way. There's some real powerful people depending on us right now. They need us to manage the response to these events, to let the public know what's going on, and the last thing we need is it going wider than it already fucking has. So do what you need to do, or I'm going to replace you with some producers who actually know how to produce a fucking show! This wasn't an event that only we saw, but instead someone who hijacked the TV station to put the message of liar out so everyone can know that they're being deceived. What's more is that we get definitive proof that the government is in fact covering up events by putting on a show to try to convince the public that they should feel safe. The fact that the home invasions were becoming news headlines was already a giant mistake that never should have happened in the first place, but now this. This was going to be something that needed to be fixed immediately, so Liam Hollander is ordered to go find someone called Dawn. Before we see what happens to Dawn, we get a discussion by Arnold. My name is Arnold Eugene Rivers. The date is April 8th, 1987, about a quarter past nine at night. I was involved in the Morelli construction project at Mount Greylock. I was hired due to my background in anthropology and archaeology. I've worked to excavate a number of different historical sites. Paul Morelli took me on after securing a government contract for the Greylock project. I'm recording this because I believe my life is in danger, and I likely don't have a lot of time left, so I need to leave some kind of record of my findings. On March 24th, our crew came across tunnels in the mountain that have a multitude of ancient markings and artifacts. On March 25th, Paul cleared the interior of the mountain and asked me, accompanied by a small crew, to look through the tunnels and record notes on what I was able to recognize. I was then to report to one of the project directors, named Frank Porter, to offer my perspective on our findings. I kept this to myself at the time, but what we discovered in that mountain was... Not normal. Not only did I see the impact it was having on the crew, but certain aspects of my findings did not make any sense. Many of the artifacts were pre-colonial. Some were from Native American tribes, but there were other artifacts. Some Mesoamerican and others were shockingly Clovis in nature. Finding Clovis artifacts here means that People have been coming to Mount Greylock since at least 11,000 BCE. But that's not all, no. There are artifacts I found that could potentially be from even earlier, Paleo-American cultures that we have yet to even begin studying. Then, there were artifacts and writings left by the cultures that were pre-Columbian in nature. Transoceanic contacts prior to Columbus reaching the Americas has always been largely a theory, but, but the artifacts in this mountain, they, they prove it. Ancient Chinese, Arabic, Indian, Roman, Spanish, Viking, even ancient Greek and Egyptian are findings that they alone would change world history as we know it today. I'll admit, the anthropologist in me was thrilled. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I figured it had to be a hoax, but I'm confident that it's all authentic. But my excitement was soon replaced with a looming fear and anxiety. How could such a place be so important to so many cultures for so long? There must be something immense here. Whatever it was, well, that's why I left the project. The tunnels all connected to a series of chambers deep into the interior of the mountain. That's where a majority of the relics were found. There were old baskets of herbs and spices, pottery, weapons and armor, talismans, and other religious items, countless other things, but all of it was there purposely as offerings. Arnold told Paul, the person who was working out in the tunnels before, to clear them within tape six, but Paul doesn't remember this ever happening since in his mind, the lights just suddenly appeared, meaning that Paul has always been infected since one of very few symptoms presented before was amnesia, and just didn't realize it or something else 
was pretending to be Paul during that time period. Something is definitely down there. For some reason, cultures all over the world knew about this place of Mountain Greylock. This is the same name as the title of the tapes, which just shows how significant this one area is going to be, given their offerings to something most likely dangerous, unless kept happy. However, it's been years since the last time anyone's even opened up this place. Decades or even centuries, whatever was down there is most likely not going to be happy anymore. It was billions of years ago, when our planet was still mostly fire and rock, that a Mars-sized planet that had been drifting through our solar system collided directly with the Earth. The impact was so powerful and violent that the rogue planet was blown into countless pieces of debris. This debris collected to form our moon. Many of the pieces of the unknown planet remain inside the Earth to this day. We then get a quick lesson on how the moon was created, which says this mysterious planet collided with Earth, with some of its debris still being located within our planet. Wonder if that has anything to do with what's down inside those tunnels. A little strange and random fact to just put inside of here. Adam's police department, dispatcher Carey speaking. Um, yes, I'm calling to report a break-in at my co-worker's house. What is your name, sir? My name is Liam Hollander. Okay, Liam, you said this was your co-worker's house. What is your co-worker's address? Ah, uh, it's on uh, Parker, Parker Hill Road in Adams, uh, number 491. 491 Parker Hill Road, is that right? Yes. Okay, can you tell me, is anybody hurt? Liam, are you still with me? Yes, sorry. Is anybody hurt? Yes. Liam Hollander is one of the three people from the start of the tape who is ordered to go find someone called Don to help fix the issue of the hijacked TV station. Though things aren't as they seem as when Liam makes it to Don's home, he is on his bed with his face almost looking like it was melted off or pulled apart. It's a really messy and graphic scene. Then I witnessed many altars constructed out of the mountain stone, along with evidence of mass animal and human sacrifice. And the carvings in the walls of these sacrificial chambers, I couldn't recognize a single familiar symbol, and it, it made me sick to even look at them. Let me be clear. I am not, nor have I ever been, a religious man. But there's something in that mountain. S something people of countless cultures over the history of our planet have been worshipping. But I don't know why. But I could feel it. Whatever's down there, I could feel it. It was like being trapped in a fever dream. I swear I could hear a voice and even felt compelled to go further, to speak to whatever's down there. I don't know, I, I don't know, I, I haven't been right since I, I keep hearing this droning in my head, ceaseless, all day and night. I, I can't sleep, just droning, always droning. But, but that, that doesn't matter right now. I informed Mr. Porter in my report that the archaeological findings in the mountain are of monumental historical importance, and that there is certainly more to be discovered, and I recommended discontinuing construction there. But it's not as though I have any authority over this project. I fully expected to be ignored. Mr. Porter called me on the evening of March 28th, and we spoke on the phone briefly. It was as I thought. He disregarded my concerns. I informed him that I wasn't going to return to the site. He insisted I did, said I was a valuable asset to the project, even offered me a substantial raise, and wanted me to lead a specifically organized team that would clear the tunnels of artifacts before excavation would continue. I, quote unquote, could be responsible for the biggest historical finding of all time, he said. I refused again. 
I won't put a price on my sanity or my health, especially after seeing what was happening to the crew. This thing has some sort of mental influence of those who come near it. Even without looking at it, it still has such a powerful grip on Arnold's mental state. Though, after years of being trapped underneath this mountain, its power probably has diminished since, after leaving this area, Arnold no longer had a strong desire to help clear those tunnels, since he knew that it could potentially negatively affect anyone who gets close to it. We then get a series of individuals from before and after, whatever is affecting them fully occurs. I'm not exactly sure what it is yet, but for now, I'll just be calling whatever it is the Greylock virus. Since I'm unsure if it actually is a virus, some sort of paranormal possession, or something else entirely. These people seem to almost become undead, and even grant them supernatural abilities such as vomit that's acidic, immunity to all sorts of pain, mild mind control, and various other features. For simplicity's sake, these people were essentially becoming zombies, but not completely like those usually associated within this genre, since although they do have various traits such as an unnatural cannibalistic appetite, homicidal tendencies, and immunity to pain, they're more than just simple zombies. Some of the individuals mentioned were unable to communicate, but others had intelligence and even tried to act calm and nice to trick staff into trusting them before attacking them indiscriminately. Like I said, these aren't mindless zombies. They're intelligent. But that begs the question, what are they? Before, there was a heavy focus on these thaw forms, which is what I thought these things were. A thaw form manifesting into humans, but were too distorted to fully render properly. But now, we know that these were people before they were transformed into these things, and possibly have nothing to do with thaw forms at all. Or at least, there's a stronger implication that it's actually a virus spreading around, which only caused the previous tapes to have a much darker tone to them, especially tape 4 which is when we hear about the intruders. Before we assumed that the intruders were thought forms that escaped, but now we can theorize that there are highly intelligent zombie like beings, with those previous victims not being ended properly, but instead eaten alive. I'll be saving my perspective of what happened with an entire series at the end, so don't worry. I consider myself incredibly lucky to not be in that condition right now. Oddly, he quickly accepted my second refusal, wished me luck in my future endeavors, but before I could say anything else, he hung up. But it seemed I'd made the right choice. I heard something awful happened up at Mount Greylock, and then simultaneously, there were all of these things that have been happening around the mountain. The home invasions, the dead bodies that fell from the sky over Cheshire, the pregnancy phenomena, so many other unexplainable things. They all must be related, and I've been trying to figure out how. I've connected with a local investigator who's been trying to get to the bottom of this. I've shared with him everything I have, though I feel that I've been being watched. I feel a looming threat that I can't really explain. Would the government really send someone to kill me over this? I feel like I'm paranoid, like I've lost some of my mind. But I came home from the grocery store the other day, and my front door was unlocked. And I know I had locked it before I left. I scanned my entire house for traces of anything, but found nothing out of the ordinary. I even checked and replaced all of the light bulbs. <laughs> oh, God. Saying that loud like this. It makes me realize how crazy I sound. I've always been a rational man. There's a logical explanation behind everything. Well, I'm glad that I put all of this into a recording. Perhaps that was what I needed to snap me out of this. Honestly, I feel much better just talking about it. <gasps> this can't be... Oh my god! That's my basement door! No, 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 no! Camcoder! Oh, what is the damn camcoder? There it is! Thank god! Look here! 
I'm inside my bedroom closet. I'm going to keep the tape recorder running, and I'm hiding in here with my files. If something happens to me, and you find any tapes or files somehow, please bring it to the investigator, Jimmy Malcolm of North Adams. That goes for this video footage as well. Come on out, it's the police. <laughs> <laughs> Although he thought he was being paranoid, he probably wasn't, as the government probably was watching him this entire time, especially with the way the seemingly secretive organization just allowed this man who saw something that could potentially make their existence known to the public walk away so easily. He brings up an investigator named Tim, which is where we go heavy on the theorizing about who attacked him. But this was an entity that was more frequently shown throughout the tapes, especially when it relates to something that needed to be kept a secret. I'm not sure how, but perhaps one of these zombies was able to make some sort of contract with Simeodin.usa, and is their quote unquote cleaner. We've seen them during the home invasions, then in the camera systems near the tunnels, and now, once again, here. What's interesting is that this thing is able to replicate voices, as it probably was a thing that sounded like a little girl to lure out Arnold out of the closet, and when that didn't work, it tried to sound like the police, before just breaking open the closet door. We even hear what I'm assuming is this thing biting chunks out of Arnold, with its sound design expressing this quite vividly with its wet and crunchy mixture. We get a TV station talking about how President Lyndon B. Johnson, a real life US president who served during the 1960s, is planning on giving every household electronics in order to give people better access to communication. This includes things such as TVs, telephones, and radios, but it doesn't just stop there as other devices like smoke alarms, burglar alarms, and flashlights in order to promote safety. Who's going to help provide these devices? Well, none other than Simeodin.USA. Before, an article of President Kennedy saying no to Simeodin.USA, though what he's saying no to is unclear. If you want a quick history lesson, John F. Kennedy was a president before Lyndon B. Johnson, who took office right after JFK was assassinated. This is a real thing. What they're trying to say here is that this company has a lot of power and influence. If you get in the way of their goals, you will be dealt with, no matter who you are. We then get a series of camera angles from within a home, which probably shows that they are giving out free camera devices, which was just in reality done in order to spy on the American people. We get confirmation that they were really behind the plot against Kennedy for his attempt to expose something called the NAI program. The rest of the speech they give is a generic politician trying to connect people for the good of mankind. 
but it's the video splices in between that are much more important. We learn more about that NAA program, which for now, all we know is that they watch and listen to people's everyday lives. Mr. Rothwell also stated that these monumental benefits- Well... <laughs> That kind of ruined my previous theory and opened the gates to a bunch of new ones. We find out that there are actually multiple entities of these masked creatures, which was something I did not expect, believing there to only be one. The final camera scene was certainly something else. Support the National Access Initiative Program. Monster tells the little girl to wake up and even knows her name, which is strange. A weird take, but this could actually have been someone who she knew, but got infected, causing the change into this thing. Not wanting to scare her, they say they're her imaginary friend. It's a bittersweet moment of someone turned into a monster, potentially one of her parents, and unable to interact with a loved one due to what they became. Where are they? I still can't really see because my eyes are so bad. You 
reach out and I'll put them into your hand. Okay? Okay. The Johnson administration went on to say that their current projections for a nationwide release are for some time between mid-1966 and early 1967. Never mind. <laughs> Without her glasses, she couldn't see who she was talking to, which led to her getting attacked. So why is the NAA program something they want to implement? Other than the government wanting more control and spying on people, another reason could be to document any potential attacks to slow down the spread of this new virus that has been popping up from various homes. If we do think of this thing as a virus, then the situation on T4 was an outbreak that they most likely want to prevent from happening again. This could have been an extreme measure done in order to prevent such an event from happening again. This would have been the final tape that we would have to talk about, except about a week ago from writing the script, the 10th tape was found, simply called Messages from the Dead, and it's the longest within the series. It's very strange to start a tape with someone in black gloves picking up a dead rat. Not until we get dropped into what appears to be an interview with the police. Um, after we lost the baby, um, I stayed home for almost a month. We both took a heart, but I was just really worried about Tiffany. She seemed to only be getting worse this time. She spent a lot of time by herself. When it came time for me to return to work, we decided I would call home every day during my lunch break just so we could talk and check in on each other. She always picked up the phone whenever I called. She knew it would worry me sick if she didn't pick up the phone. But this time, on that day, she didn't pick up. Tiffany was the same girl who had her unborn baby suddenly disappear, with her fiance constantly calling her to try to make her feel better after that traumatic event. It's similar to a miscarriage, except the baby was never truly there. You know, just, I'm getting a bit worried, so please call me back, okay? Love you. Okay, I'm not sure what's going on, but I'm gonna head home. I'm sorry, I'm just... I'm kind of freaking out. I'll be there soon. I love you. Dr. Heinrich Albrecht, medical examiner, Westfield. May 19th, 1987, 3.23 p.m. Integrate report for Tiffany Elaine Marie Crisaldi. Caucasian female, age 28, 29, 26, 33, 24, 25. Case number 87-091-HA. This autopsy will be conducted at the request of the Adams Police Department. Initial external evaluation reveals a resinous black substance adhered to the face neck and upper thoracic region. 
With her fiance getting worried from Tiffany ignoring his calls, he quickly rushes home, only to find a switch to her autopsy report. Some sort of black substance has been leaking from her eyes, with there appearing to be no struggle before her death. Of particular note, and the reason for this specialist report is an unusual finding on the abdomen, specifically below the sternum. A symbol of some sort has been carved into the flesh. Equally concerning is the absence of hemorrhaging in the surrounding tissues. Due in part to this, I have been able to ascertain that this symbol was carved into the skin post-mortem. In regard to timing, based on my analysis, I would say the cuts were likely made several hours after death. The reasoning for even having this kind of special report was due to some sort of symbol being carved into her skin near her stomach, though there was no hemorrhaging which indicated that the symbol was carved only after she passed away, several hours after. The cause of death was never found. We then transitioned to Tiffany when she was just a child. Okay Tiffany, we're recording now. Okay. So, Tiffany, you just had your sixth birthday, didn't you? Yeah. Did you have a party? Yeah. How was it? Good. That's good. You're awfully quiet today. Are you seeing them again? Yes. Can you see them right now? Yes. Where are they? Where are they, Tiffany? They're <laughs> everywhere. These imaginary beings that she was seeing could be some thought forms, which might be the reason why the symbol showed up on her body years later, and could explain why she had a manifestation of a baby within her as an adult. Today is May 19, 1987. Time is 8.03 p.m. I conducted an examination of Miss Tiffany Crisaldi today. Her body arrived shortly before I was to leave the office for the day, but I decided to at least begin external examinations. Though it seems misfortune loomed over the proceedings, Electrical flickers and inexplicable drops and spikes in room temperature. Ah, repairs may be required. I wanted to refrain from mentioning this part whatsoever, but... But I feel compelled to do so. After placing Miss Crisaldi in storage and moving on to cleaning up, my sister Sarah mentioned that she'd heard what sounded like a woman crying, coming from the direction of the cooler. I shrugged off her remark and let her leave early, telling her she was likely stressed or overtired, and I continued cleaning up on my own. I didn't dare to tell her that I heard it as well. The 
supernatural elements of his story are coming much stronger there in his part, as the idea of the thought forms becoming spirits right after death could be explaining what's causing these odd occurrences, interfering with the electricity as well as the sound of a woman crying, with the heavy focus on the tears of Tiffany's body, the heartbreak of having her unborn child disappear could have been a major factor as to why she couldn't handle carrying on. Which is why the thought form that she left behind was simply just crying. We then move back to the therapy session from when Tiffany was a child once more. Okay, are you ready, Tiffany? I think so. Are you nervous? Yeah. Okay. I'll need you to follow my instructions, okay, Tiffany? As long as you do that, everything will be fine. Can you do that for me? Okay. Good. I'm going to play some sounds that will help you through this exercise. Good. Now close your eyes and keep them closed until I tell you to open them. I want you to picture yourself standing outside your house in your front yard. It's a beautiful day out with big fluffy clouds and a blue sky. No one else is around. Now look down at the grass around you and watch how each blade moves in a gentle breeze. Now look forward and see your house. And look around and see the trees around your yard. Watch how the breeze affects the leaves as it passes through. Make the wind blow a little harder, enough so the branches are swaying a little bit. You can hear all the rustling of the leaves around you. Wind calms down now, and you begin walking very slowly towards the front door of your house. Step, 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 step. And with each step you take, it looks like the day is getting later and later. Soon the golden rays of the sunset are shining against your house. The front door is closer now, but you still have some more steps to go. Step. 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 It begins normal, trying to immerse Tiffany into his world, but slowly, things don't feel right. You're at your bedroom door now. You reach out your hand and grasp the doorknob and turn it. The door opens, and you can see that your room looks just like it did the last you saw it. You see the colorful quilt on your bed. You see your small white dresser with all the stickers and scuff marks, just like always. Your stuffed animals are all resting by your purple toy box. You feel comfortable. You feel safe. You are alone. You walk into a room, and that's when you can see something different that's never been there before. Tell me what you see. It's... it's a door next to my window. That's right, it's a door. What does the door look like, Tiffany? It... it looks black. It has weird marks on it. The wood looks weird. Walk to the door and open it. I'm scared. It doesn't matter if you're scared. You must open the door. Good job, Tiffany. Now tell me what's on the other side of the door. It's a small room. Somebody's in there. No, Tiffany, you're alone. No. No. There's someone here. He's facing away from me. He's standing and tall. He's very tall. 
Tiffany, you are alone. Nobody else is there. Now tell me what else is in the room. There's a TV. The screen is all fuzzy. And the tall man is watching it. Tiffany, I want you to focus on removing the man from your mind. When I snap my fingers, he will be gone. You will be alone. The man's shaking. His body is cracking. Okay, Tiffany, I'm going to count down from five. When I snap my fingers, you will return to the real world. Five, you're feeling more awake. He's turning around. Four, everything around you is becoming He's amazing. He's looking at me. He sees me. Three, Tiffany, you can feel the chair you're sitting in again. Two, everything around you fades to the blackness behind you. One, full control of your body. Zero, we're awake, Tiffany. You'll return to reality now. This wasn't a normal therapist, and by the title of this tape, Messages from the Dead, he most likely was trying to cause Tiffany to go to the other side in order to stop her from seeing things, or cause those effects to be stronger. But this didn't work, and she found someone, a tall man. Could they be the same tall man that the miner saw previously? We don't know for now, but things get dangerous as he tries to force her away and back to the living world. I have some very important information for you pertaining to the events you have been investigating. You must have questions regarding who I am, how I located you, and what reason I am contacting you. I won't be answering any of those questions. Do not have the degree of your time. For now, I am simply offering you information. You can take it or leave it. It's impressive you remained alive for this long. But then again, you've gone to great lengths in the past in order to survive, haven't you? I'm going to tell you a story, Jane. A story that you've been dying to hear. Tiffany is still alive, or at least, not fully dead? That is all the tapes presented currently from the Greylock series. So, after all of that, what is going on within the series? Well, let's piece things together in a timeline to fully understand what we really have so far. Now, to piece things together in a chronological way, I don't remember who said this, but someone brought up a good point that a lot of these analog horror series aren't confusing lore-wise since once we figure out the order that these videos belong in, it's a lot easier to digest the information presented. The first ever event to actually happen involves that temple within Mount Greylock. Now, it's important to note that we don't actually know what was ever discovered inside, but whatever it was, it set forth a series of events that slowly affected the United States, specifically starting within Massachusetts. 
This temple was theorized to have been used to give offerings to something deep within it, and not only were those local to the area, but instead various other cultures from all around the world, spanning countless unknown years, only to be forgotten and buried due to some unknown reason. Well, forgotten for now. Tape 9 was technically the first official tape with the discussing President John F. Kennedy's assassination in 1963, which in the same year, Lyndon B. Johnson would replace Kennedy as the president and sign the NAI, or the National Access Initiative. Already, we know that the Simeodin.USA is an organization influential enough to get rid of powerful figures like the leaders of the United States of America, and has even stated that they will do anything to get rid of those who get in their way. At this point, I don't believe that they have any idea what the Greylock Temple holds, and simply want more power in order to control, to watch over, and spy on the American people. Before you say that they found something unnatural, with the little girl getting attacked at the end of that tape, the date shown for that specific attack was December 29th, 1994, more than three whole decades into the future. So for now, they are a lovable charitable company in the public's eye, and a bloodthirsty secret organization under it all. The next significant event has to be when Dr. Bernard Hayes gave his speech on October 4th, 1981. Now, there's two things about this event that I want to talk about, and it has to do with the possibilities of when Dr. Bernard was hired. If he was hired the same year he gave this speech, this most likely marked the start of when the Simeodin.USA company started to shift their focus onto more supernatural matters, with a very ambitious goal of not only meeting God, but also becoming his equal. With the second possibility being that he was always an influential figure within the company, however, we never saw him before this event, so in my opinion, he most likely was picked out with promises of causing people to reach their true potential through spiritual means. However, this greed would probably go on to cause one of the worst incidents in history. On March 24, 1987, Simeodin.USA would begin their tunneling efforts within Mount Greylock. Whether they knew what was inside is unknown, but it would release some sort of virus infecting all the miners, with Paul Morale being the last person to have symptoms on March 29th, then finally where he turns into this grotesque thing on March 30th. Mount Greylock is a real place and is located in Massachusetts which explains some of the events, first being the home invasions that took place where we theorized were the result of thought forms, but now knowing about the events within those tunnels, the quote unquote group of attackers were most likely the infected miners. I'm not sure just how infectious this virus is, since those miners most likely got infected just by being near those tunnels, so it could have been airborne or more akin to the mainstream zombie infections, where those who were bitten or shared bodily fluids also gained the virus. We don't even know if this thing even is a virus at all, or something much more supernatural, but it could be a mixture of both, which I'll try to explain in a little bit more detail very soon. All you need to understand is that soon after the miners got infected, they probably ventured down the mountains and into the various residential homes since this plague has been told to give those infected with a strong cannibalistic urge. With the homes being broken into and the NAI program still in effect at this point, the Simeodin.USA company was quick in finding that out and told local authorities to issue an emergency broadcast. At this point, they weren't able to fully understand what was going on except that there were multiple people going around eating each other. This was a strange event, but something they probably were able to quickly understand was that these are most likely the same miners that they sent to Mount Greylock. On April 8th, 1987, Arnold Rivers talks about his experience within what was inside Mount Greylock, which also shows various images as well, most likely indicating he took many different pictures and videos of what was inside there himself. This also was around the time when others were beginning to get infected by the Greylock virus, which they would show within the same tape. We know that these are regular people deterred before and after images, as well as showing the dates of when each photo was taken. This is where I want to talk more about this new Greylock virus. I believe this isn't actually a virus, or at least not by its typical definition. What I think it actually is, is a curse, created by whatever entity the Greylock Temple worshipped. 
a little weird but stick with me. For one, it only targeted the miners in the beginning and didn't go after Arnold, even though he also went down there as well. The miners were going to destroy certain things in order to build whatever construction site they were ordered to go for. But Arnold was more interested in the history of that location and has even recommended that all construction be stopped as well. Which is why he also started to hear some sort of voice compelling him to go down further. Although it's a curse, it also works very similar to a zombie-like virus and also grants those in effect certain special characteristics, whether it's immunity to all pain, spitting acidic liquids, or even very weak forms of mind control. These all have the purpose of allowing those infected to rack up higher body counts to punish those around it. Perhaps viewing all of humanity at this point to be its enemy, for not bringing it any offerings for what could potentially be hundreds if not thousands of years. Not making them into mindless puppets either, but instead allowing them to have intelligence to carry out its plans even easier. On that same day, on April 8th, 1987, Arnold Rivers was fatally attacked by something, though I also want to touch on exactly what he was attacked by. There are multiple important entities within this universe, but the two most notable ones that we could actually see within the tapes are the affected who have this rotting appearance and these figures who look like they are wearing a mask. Not a lot is known about these things, but I do feel as though it's safe to say that they are different from the affected or at least an advanced form of them. Within tape 8, we learn that they can mimic voices, most likely only voice lines that they heard before and not new sentences due to them using a little girl's voice and a police officer's lines. Not only do we hear what appears to be Arnold being eaten alive due to the sound of his flesh ripping apart, whatever these things are, they're most likely more patient than the infected, as this thing most likely was what was causing Arnold to feel like he was being stalked. Which leads to a very interesting theory. Way back to tape 6, when the miners were first starting to get infected, they also felt like they were being watched by some sort of tall man, which is why they installed various different hunting cameras around the area. Whether it was a collective group's fear or some sort of other intense emotion, we see the development of a thaw form starting as a green light to a transparent person, and then finally, this masked figure. This could have been the origins of these things as in tape 9, before the final camera scene, we see at least 6 of them within a forest. For what purpose would one of these thought forms want to attack Arnold is unclear. We also learn of a person called Jim Melgren, who is an investigator that Arnold was in contact with and possibly someone who was investigating the events that were happening after the Greylock Mountains incident. Which could explain the second table when someone was going into the mountains. This also kind of explains the trail of blood, mutilated animal carcasses, and finally the human skull. We don't know if there was only one or multiple skulls found, but we definitely do know there was at least one. Like I said before, these infected miners were going down the mountain in order to find people. This infection doesn't necessarily make those involved into mindless idiots, but does let them have their intelligence intact, which is how they knew where to go. While they were traveling down, they attacked anything they came in contact with, humans and animals. Though the only thing that we still do not know anything about has to be that floppy disk found near the end of that tape. All we could really do is speculate. So it could have been Arnold's tape that was found and they chose that area as a drop off zone for Tim in order to prevent others from viewing what was inside in fear of it getting destroyed by those within the simiodin.usa company, as well as to point them into the right direction of where to start their investigation. I say this since Tim most likely already knew the events that was going on within that area due to the emergency broadcast that was playing around, which we hear either on the radio or Tim's distorted voice talking about it directly within that tape. What could be interesting to know is that tape 4, the tape about the home invasions, could be directly linked to Tim walking around on the mountain trail in order to further investigate what's going around in that area. As he slowly walks around the homes before breaking in to investigate what exactly was going on. They're holding a flashlight to walk around and we don't see them getting attacked directly, which will be something I'll bring up soon. You can mention the person at the end of the tape, but that person most likely is someone completely different and it's just a resident looking outside out of curiosity. Soon after this event, tape 7, or the back to normal news broadcast, will be shown to the public. Dan will be hijacked by an unknown group or a person to show the word, liar. As well as a photoshopped picture of the news anchor potentially as one of the infected. Whether this was to tell the public about the spreading infection that the government has yet to contain, how they're spying on them, or something entirely else isn't clear. But I feel as though it's safe to say that using the face resembling one of the affected that was most likely the first one. 
Which is why in the beginning of tape 8, we get one of the GBS executives getting extremely mad about this event. Another thing to note is that there's a triangle with an eye that could be repeatedly found on many different TV news stations, which is probably owned by a Simeo Din.USA company to spread certain agendas, only showing just how far their reach is since it's even in the media. On May 18th, 1987, Tiffany Crisaldi's fiancé would call her multiple times, but after not being able to reach her, he would rush over to only find her body. As we know, she wouldn't stay gone forever, as she could be seen alive. I don't believe this is actually Tiffany, but instead a thought form of her consciousness coming to life during her last moments. Since it has been shown that she was able to create thought forms previously. In the same tape, not exactly sure when on a timeline this occurred, but within a rat was this small tape which would have been directed towards Dim Mulgren, the detective from before. Not much is told to us, but they have the same symbol that was found on Tiffany's body. Could this potentially be some sort of organization that is directly trying to oppose Simeodin.USA? There was one significant thing that they say, which is that Tim did a lot to survive for this long, which could be linked to how they were going to dangerous places like the residential homes when the invasion started, in order to investigate what was going on even further. There is one final thing within this tape that I failed to mention, but kept it until this point on purpose, which was the interview of Tiffany as a child. What we know for a fact is that she was 28 at the time of her death on May 18th, 1987, and when Dr. Bernard was first mentioned within the series was in 1981. She states herself that she was 6 years old during the beginning of that interview, and using simple math, we could figure out pretty easily that the year was most likely 1965. This could imply some things, such as the government experimenting on children from as early as that year in order to have them access the other side or use them to create thought forms. Also, who was this unknown therapist? Was this Dr. Bernard in his early years, and this was the event that led him to become obsessed with the supernatural? All we could do is speculate on who exactly is conducting this interview, since in all honesty, we don't even know if the government is responsible for this specific event. But that doesn't mean that we don't have things that could be tied to this quote-unquote therapy session. This event could have been the unintentional start of the creation of Unit 13 to specifically focus on the goal of making thought forms and could also explain the footage at the end of tape 9 where the little girl was attacked by what I believe to actually be a thought form. Since she mentions that she went to a quote, a weird doctor's office place that I had to go to. I know that we are jumping back and forth within the tapes, but to understand the events in order, it's important to do that since things are jumbled up quite a bit. We go all the way to October 1990, where someone says that the NAA program is a trap and finds out how the government is spying on them, which could be showing how Tim, this mysterious detective from before, is starting to let people know that there's more going on within this company. Don't worry, we are almost done. Then on January 2nd, 1993, the Simeo Din.USA company creates an orientation protocol tape which explains something called Unit 13 as well as being the first mention of the Thought Form Manifestor. We don't know when this thing was created but let's just assume for now that this thing was a pretty recent invention. December 29th, 1994 is when we go back to the little girl being attacked by a thought form, showing that this event is still affecting the United States and has not been contained properly. Or at least shows why there is a glitching effect when they try to say that thought forms can't pass through barriers, meaning that they're still trying to experiment on children using a thought form manifestor, and now these things that they're creating them with are most likely following them home to be their quote unquote imaginary friends. The very first tape that we see within the series, tape 1, was most likely Tim, the detective that Arnold was in contact with hacking into the Simeodin.USA network in order to access their system archives. We don't know when, but let's just assume that this is the final event to occur within the series since it would be funny to imagine the first tape to be the last event. Now, that is all the events that we can confirm the dates of effectively since they have the time that they have occurred somewhere within those tapes or where we can make an educated guess about when they occurred. Except for when the first tape and when the Greylock Temple was created since we don't know much about those places at all. Now, for the final thing. What do I think that temple hides? Well, to be honest, it could be anything. But there was one strange event that I just couldn't explain. 
Okay, there were multiple strange events that I couldn't explain, but the one that I want to focus on was the pastor on tape 2 that suddenly changed their tune to talk about accepting the devil into your life. Do I believe the Greylock Temple holds a demon? No. Instead, I believe it to be part of that mysterious planet that hit Earth many years ago, which would create the moon. A piece of it stayed on Earth and later would develop to be some sort of cosmic horror entity, akin to those of Lovecraft's work. Some sort of being beyond our comprehension that has no true form but is still sentient, requiring an out-of-body experience to truly grasp what it was, hence the series having a large focus on spirituality and thought forms. Oh god, and that is my explanation what exactly has happened so far in order. Though it is still a jumbled mess that could change with the release of more videos and I'm extremely excited to see what else this creator has for the future. And if I got something wrong, please don't feel shy to let me know in the comments. Maybe I got a date wrong, maybe I mixed something up, it happens. The creator of the Greylock series almost has nothing in the description of his videos, nor anything in his about section, which was weird when I saw a bunch of people saying thank you Rob in the comments multiple times, which is when I did some external research <coughs> Reddit. <laughs> and found out about a creator called Rob Gavigan, who is the mind behind it all, who appears to be a horror channel based on true crime and paranormal activities. With a subscriber count of more than 3 million, I am surprised I haven't heard of them before. Not only should you check out the Greylock tapes yourself since there is so much potential behind them and viewing them yourselves just is a better experience. Definitely do check out Rob Gavigan's videos as well, especially if you're into true crime. That's all I really had to talk about for this video. Just a quick review and analysis of the Greylock tapes. I really can't wait to see what else this channel holds for the future. In the meantime, I'm extremely tired for talking for so long, so I'm going to go take a nap. Until next time. A quick thank you to Ori, Krev, Ryan Broes, Samuel Petunias, Beyond, Appletree, Angel GCXS, Shyplier, for supporting the channel by becoming members. Thank you so much, it really means a lot.